Last week, we looked at one of the most important scriptures in all of the Bible. It is particularly important for one who's trying to grasp the overall message of the Bible. It's Genesis 3.15. In Genesis 3.15, God verbally confronts humanity's foe. The serpent, a.k.a. Satan. God, in his powerful voice, declares, I will put enmity between you, the serpent, and the woman. Between your seed, the serpent's seed, and her seed. He, the promised seed of the woman, shall crush the serpent's head, and the serpent shall bruise the promised seed's heel. This is the first time you've heard that scripture. It can be difficult to wrap your mind around it, but this scripture really provides the narrative backbone or plot line of the entire scriptures. One could say that the Bible reveals the outworking of Genesis 3.15 through human history. So in summary, in case you're not familiar with the overarching story of the Bible, God will preserve two seeds. When you read the Bible, you're going to see this over and over again. God's preserving two seeds. One of them is the serpent seed. One of them is the righteous seed, the seed of the woman, the remnant. The serpent seed always hates and looks to persecute and enslave the righteous remnant. The serpent seed wants to crush the righteous remnant. And time after time, time after time, book after book, testament after testament, God will miraculously intervene. And He will work to thwart the serpent and his seed and their pursuit of stamping out the righteous remnant. And ultimately, the Bible crescendos by presenting to us Jesus Christ. The ultimate seed of the woman who crushes the serpent at the cross, who thwarts his diabolical plans by way of his resurrection, and is at work today to restore God's children, the elect, from creation's curse. In Genesis 4, we are looking at the preservation of the serpent's seed. That's an interesting thought. That God not only sovereignly preserves the righteous seed, the seed of Abel, the seed of Seth, but God sovereignly preserves the serpent seed, for He has plans for them too. I hope this morning you will contemplate of which seed am I? As we look at the serpent seed in Genesis 4, we will once again, with the Holy Spirit's help, be brought to a position of awe concerning the unfathomable mercy of God. And we'll be reminded of His wrath. And my prayer is that through seeing, we might be gloriously changed. Let's pray and ask the Lord to help as we dive into this message. Father, I pray that we would understand Genesis 4 like never before, that we would see how it fits into the overarching story. But, but even more than that, Lord, I pray that we would desire to be part 
of the righteous seed. I pray that our affections would be kindled for Christ. I pray that we will sit in awe and be transformed by a beautiful vision of Christ that the text leads us to. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Start with me. Chapter 4, verse 1. Adam intimately knows his wife. She conceives and gives birth to Cain. And here's what she says. What she says is an explanation of why he, she named him Cain. Because Cain means one of two things, and we're not quite sure exactly which. On one hand, Cain means to acquire. So in some of your translations, it'll read like this. She'll say, because I have gotten a man from the Lord. And potentially we think that she hopes this man will be the snake-crushing seed. I've got him! God helped me! He promised a seed, and he's given it to me. So she names him Cain. It's also possible to translate this phrase, I have created a man as the Lord created man. Uh, the, the Hebrew word can bear both meanings, and this too makes plausible sense, because in Genesis 1 and 2, God made man out of the dust of the ground, and now the woman fulfilling the Adamic mission to be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, fulfilling the beginning of God's gracious promise that through her, a seed would rise up that would rescue humanity. So, so perhaps she's identifying with that and she's saying, I, in fulfillment of my commission, in fulfillment of the gracious promise, I, as the Lord created from the womb of the earth, I, through the womb of my bosom have created a man. Now, notice in the text how it says, and she bore, again, his brother Abel. And this is kind of interesting. It all depends on what you read into the text. So, so, it's possible that, here's what it means, it's possible that it means, and again, Adam knew his wife, and again, she conceived, and again, she brought forth a son, and they happened to call this one, Abel. That's quite possible. So then, one's the older brother, one's the younger brother, separated by a portion of time that we're just not told. It's also possible that these are twins. And that the sense of the statement is this, and again, there's no new conception because these are twins. So we don't mention the conception. We don't mention the intimacy. It's just out came one, boom, out came the other, and she named it Abel. We're not sure. But we quickly learn about these young men. Notice the characterization of the men in verse 2. One is a shepherd, and the other a farmer. Now, beginning in verse 3, the setting of worship is described. In the course of time, Cain brings to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And then Abel also brings to the Lord an offering, but this is different. It's the firstborn of his flock, and he brings the fat portions with it. Some translations would read, the fattest portions, the choicest portions. And then we're surprised that the Lord, verse 4, the Lord had respect, he had regard for Abel and his offering, but the Lord had no respect, no regard for Cain and his offering, and Cain gets angry and his countenance falls, and we the reader are saying, what just happened? I don't get it. Is God arbitrary? He's like a judge who just likes certain things and doesn't like other things. If we're not careful, we're 
we're going to pity Cain. What do we make of this? Well, when we read the narratives of Scripture, we have to understand that we're only told what we need to know. So there's much that's left unsaid. Remember that. That's critical. Also, remember as we read the narratives of Scripture that oftentimes the things that we will read later on in the movie reinform what we first saw but yet did not understand. Why would God accept Abel and reject Cain? Now, let me give you some possibilities, and then let me lead you to a pretty sound answer. Some have said, based on how chapter 3 ended, with the sacrifice of an animal or animals and the provision of skins, the investiture of Adam and Eve, clothing them, not just clothing them physically, but providing atonement for them by way of sacrifice and the shedding of innocent blood, the innocent bearing the wrath in place of the guilty. Some have said when you get to chapter 4, we should assume that God has instructed Adam and his sons further on how to appropriately sacrifice. And the problem here in this text is that one comes to God by way of blood and the other comes to God, but he makes no atonement, no shedding of blood. Now this is possibly the problem because in Leviticus 17.11 we find the following. So later on in the story we find the following. God says this, the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I've given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your soul, for it's the blood that makes atonement for the soul. And Hebrews confirms that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. So it is quite possible. Now, now the thing that you need to remember is this. These men understood the sacrificial requirements. They understood it. And it's quite possible that, that one in recognizing his sin, in trusting in God's gracious provision of sacrifice, one comes by way of blood, the other comes by way of works. And that would be a consistent message of Scripture. The only way for man to be made right with God, it's not through human effort. It's through atonement the specific atonement of Jesus Christ, the shed blood of Jesus Christ. But there's another idea. You see, the problem with that idea is that if you keep reading in the Old Testament, you'll find that God is frequently pleased with bloodless sacrifices. In the book of Leviticus, there are prescribed for the children of Israel specific sacrifices that have no blood. It's all grain and fruits and vegetables that they're to present to the Lord. So, so you can't necessarily say, all right, the problem is there's no blood here. Because later on in the scripture, God is very pleased to accept sacrifices that lack blood. Even prescribes it. So some would say this. The difference is pointed to in the text. Remember, Cain, the farmer, brought of the fruits of the ground. Now listen carefully. Abel brings, not just the flock, firstling, firstborn of the flock. What's missing from Abel? He brought the fruit of the ground. No mention of first fruit. And if we keep reading in the scripture, God commands Israel that the first of the harvest belongs to me. The first that breaks the womb in your cattle belongs to me. And, and then notice what's also mentioned about Abel's offering. It's described, he brings the choicest portions. So we get this idea that, that one brought an offering, but it was kind of leftover, second rate just enough to get by. And the other brought an offering just as God prescribed. It was his best. It was the choicest. But I'm going to suggest to you that even that explanation is somewhat deficient. 
Because all throughout the scriptures, what God is primarily concerned with is not externals, but internals. And I'm going to suggest to you the best way to understand this text is that Cain is rejected because of his heart. And his heart condition is externally displayed through his inferior sacrifice. I want you to listen to what the author of Hebrews says with respect to Abel. And by learning about Abel, we can then better understand Cain. Here's what it says in Hebrews 11, verse 4. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which his faith-filled, excellent sacrifice, he obtained witness that he was righteous. The testimony of his righteousness was communicated through his sacrifice, which was rooted in his heart, a heart of faith. God testifying of his gifts, and by it, he being dead, yet speaks. So here's what I'm saying. The reason God received Abel's sacrifice is more than it just being externally correct. It flowed from a heart of faith. It flowed from a heart that believed God was good. It flowed from a heart that trusted God's word and its sufficiency. It flowed from a heart that believed reconciliation, adoration, and worship towards God was, was the greatest of all human duties. It required faith, the very first to break the womb. It required faith. He's giving his best and he must live off the rest. And it's the faith that pleases God. What does the scripture say? Hebrews 11, 6. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Let's let that inform us today. Your worship today. Today, and yet today in the sense of the entire week, the span of your entire life. How is God receiving your worship? Is your worship rooted in faith? You believe He's the best. You treasure His goodness. You will give Him of the first and foremost, and you will live off the rest. You will give Him your time. You will give Him your best energies. You will give Him your most lavish of treasures, and you'll do with the, with the rest. Or is your worship rooted in a very low view of God? He is not good. He's not worthy of your best. The best is reserved for you. The best time, the best of your talents, the best of your treasures. Now I want to inform you a little bit further concerning Cain and Abel because I don't want you to think that I'm just eisegeting the text, reading into the text what I want to see in the text. In 1 John chapter 3, it says the following concerning Abel. So this is something that you learn at, at nearly the end of the movie of Scripture. 1 John chapter 3 verse 12 says this, listen carefully. Not as Cain, who was of the wicked one, and slew his brother. Why did he slay him? Because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. Here's what I want you to listen to. Not as Cain, who was of the wicked one. So when I say this, Genesis 4 presents to us Cain as being the initial seed of the serpent. I'm saying that to you based on the authority of Scripture. He's the serpent seed. And then I also want you to see in Genesis 4, Abel. He's the seed of the woman. Eve, the mother of all living, the one who was repentant and believing, like Adam was repentant and believing. Abel follows in the faith of his mother and father. 
You have a righteous seed and you have a serpent seed. Now, do you see the plot line already being worked out in chapter 4? Genesis 3, 15, beginning to be unzipped. What was the prophecy? I will put enmity between serpent seed and woman's seed. What do we find between Cain and Abel? Enmity. All over whether or not God accepted the sacrifice. And in that Genesis 3 prophecy, what is said to the serpent? I mean, the serpent knows this. The serpent knows that one day he will be crushed by who? The righteous seed. So what does that cause him to desire? He wants to stamp out the righteous seed. So what do we find in Genesis 4? Cain desiring to slay his brother Abel. And he succeeds. Let's read the text. Before the murder takes place, there's an interesting exchange. Notice the Lord's patient mercy in verse 6. The Lord comes to Cain after he's rejected the sacrifice. And the Lord says, why are you angry? Why is your face fallen? If you do well, won't your countenance be lifted up? Won't you be accepted? If you don't do well, I'm warning you, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you. You must rule over that. Now I wish that as I preached this story that you did not know the story because if you did not know the story, this should shock you. The very first murder in history has happened. How do you imagine God would respond? I imagine that God would respond in fury. Cain, you just killed your brother! And that God would come in in righteous wrath and wipe out Cain. But how does God approach Cain? Do you see the patient mercy? Do you see that he doesn't bring accusations? He merely brings questions? Do you see how he wants Cain to think? And he wants Cain to repent. Do you see that? Friend, can I pause here and say this? God is not against you. God is for you. You may feel like God is against you. He, he is not against you. But, but you, you don't understand. He, fill in the blank. You sound a lot like Cain. God was for Cain. God says to Cain, Cain, if you do right, I'll accept you. If you stay in this angry place, I'm warning you, coiled like a snake outside your door is your anger. And it's going to slay you. And you guys know the story. Cain does not listen to the sweet mercies of God. He hardens himself even further. And he walks out that door to his own destruction, takes his brother into a field, and he slays his brother. That's verse 8, verse 9. The Lord said to Cain, Again, I am shocked by the patient mercy of God. He would have every right to have lost his patience with Cain. But notice he comes again with questions. I, I said it last week, I'll say it again. God is not your accuser. That is Satan. God desires to be your advocate. He comes along with questions. Where is your brother? It gives us the idea that he still desires Cain's repentance. And you would say, how could that be? Ezekiel 18.32, God says, I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Lord God. So turn and live. Friend, you may be here. You may feel far from God. And you may think that God has pleasure in being against you. He takes no pleasure in your destruction. He desires for you to turn and live. 
Again, in 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So the Lord says to Cain, where is Abel your brother? And Cain, he, he sure sounds like Adam and Eve. It sounds like chapter 3 replayed. Cain says, I don't know. Lie. Now, now who is Cain talking like? Serpent. And then we find the famous line that even those who do not have any interest in Scripture, if they've heard it before, Cain says, am I my brother's keeper? He's seeking to shift responsibility away from himself for his crime. The Lord said, what have you done? Perhaps one last opportunity for repentance. Think about it, man. What have you done? And perhaps there's a pause. Because while God is merciful, and while He desires all to repent, God is also just, and He's filled with righteous wrath, and He will execute justice perfectly. And the window of mercy eventually shuts. God says, the voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now, anytime you read Scripture, particularly you're reading at the beginning, you should be thinking about, does this concept ever come back into play at later portions of the movie? And, and some of you will recall, in the book of Revelation, there's a window about some people whose blood's been shed, and they're crying out from the altar to God. It's a heavenly scene in the book of Revelation, chapter 6, verse 10. It's the martyrs who are crying out to God. And here, here's what they're saying. How long, O oh Lord? How long will you be patient and not execute justice on our behalf? I want you to remember this. This will come into play in a moment when I close. What is Abel's blood calling for? Justice and vengeance. Remember that. Cain says, my, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me away from the ground. From your face I'll be hidden. I'll be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. And whoever finds me will kill me. Notice, there's no concern over his sin. There's no concern for Abel's family. There's no concern for Adam and Eve who've now lost a son. He's just crying out, this isn't fair. A sign of an unrepentant heart. But notice the Lord's mercy. The Lord says... Verse 14. Actually, verse 15. The Lord says, Whoever slays Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. We don't talk like that. What's sevenfold mean? In Hebrew, seven is a number of completion or perfection. It means this. Perfect and complete vengeance will be executed on anyone that touches Cain. Do you understand the mercy of God? What does Cain deserve? Well, if you keep reading, when you get to Genesis chapter 9, you'll find that God says to Noah, whoever sheds man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. Cain deserves to die. Do you see how merciful God is? Wow. The Lord put a mark on Cain so that anyone who found him would not attack him. We have no idea what that mark is.
Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord, and he settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Now, I want to draw your attention to verses 17 through 25. Our time is quickly fleeting, but I want you to see that what you think is a boring portion of Scripture is not really boring. We have the lineage of Cain. And you should say, why does the Bible even record these family trees? If you understand that the entire narrative of Scripture is built upon Genesis 3.15, you'll get it. What was said in Genesis 3.15? To the serpent. I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. Her seed crushes you, and you injure her seed. So the whole concept of the serpent seed and the concept of the seed of the woman are very critical to the storyline of Scripture. So we're going to spend the rest of chapter 4 fleshing out the preservation of the serpent seed. It is God who preserves the serpent seed as well as the righteous remnant. Now there are many things that I could say about this genealogy. Notice that Cain, while he was cursed to be a wanderer, what does he do in verse 17? This shows you the nature of his hardened, rebellion, rebellious heart. He goes and builds a city. What did God say? You're going to be a nomad. So what's Cain do? We'll see. I'm going to go build a city. Doesn't sound like a wanderer to me. He is still living out his rebellious heart. Still testing the patience of God. How does he name the city? Does he name the city in any way after God? Nope. He desires a name. He names it after his son. A theme is being planted. This is the first time that you find city in all of Scripture. So here we're seeing city, we're seeing civilization, city and civilization without God. City and civilization without faith. City and civilization apart from God. And notice that it's characterized by violence. I would draw your attention to the seventh generation of Adam through Cain. The name is Lamech. Verse 19, notice the violence rendered in polygamy. Scriptures never endorse polygamy. Polygamy is always, at minimum, an emotional abuse of the multiple spouses. At minimum, it's emotional abuse. Cain's line continues in this wicked, violent, rebellious manner. It's contrary to the to the design of the Creator in chapter 1 and 2. But then notice what Lamech says, verse 23. He is the focus. Lamech says unto his wives, Hear my voice. Hearken to my speech. I have slain a man to my wounding and a young man to my hurt. Verse 24. If Cain shall be avenged a sevenfold, and this is a threat. This is how you have to read it. This is a threat. Lamech is a degenerate, violent, self-centered, God-rejecting man. And notice what he says. If Cain will be avenged sevenfold, my wrath, if you dare touch me, will be seventy times seven. And again, we're not Hebrews, so this strikes us as odd. But remember, seven is the number of perfection and completion. Seventy times seven is a Hebrew way of taking something and raising it to the highest power. It's like you saying, I'm not just angry, I'm really angry. Remember that it's Lamech. Now, I want you to... Cons I want you to think about this. This is city and civilization without God. It's characterized by violence and wickedness. There's this threat, if you dare touch me, I will take out my violent revenge on you 70 times 7. That's, that's the dog-eat-dog, -dog, cutthroat world that characterizes city and civilization apart from God. That just explained some of your work environments pretty spot on. What I want you to see is we don't get left here. 
Look how the chapter ends. I don't have time to today, but if you join us next week, in chapter 5 we are going to see the lineage of Adam through the guy we're about to read. Let's read what we're about to read, then I'll finish this thought. Look at verse 25. Adam knew his wife again. She bare a son and called his name Seth. The name has significance. Here's why she named him Seth. Seth, in Hebrew, carries the idea of being appointed, being chosen. And here's what, here's what she's saying. God has given me another seed in the place of Abel. She had eyes now to understand. Her first son, Cain, was serpent seed. He slew her righteous seed. But God miraculously opens her womb again. She conceives and gives birth to another son. And now she says concerning this son, God will raise up a righteous seed. Now for anyone who has eyes to see, I believe this is the first type of resurrection. It's the seed. If you'll keep watching the movie, what will happen when Christ goes to the cross? The righteous seed will be slain by the wicked seed. And we're at this horrible moment in the story and we're wondering what will happen to the righteous seed and then three days later the righteous seed rises from the dead the fulfillment is always greater than the type here we had the righteous seed die and he did not rise but in his place a new righteous seed was reared up but all of that should point us, if we're thinking biblically, all of that should point us to the true righteous seed Jesus who dies on the cross. No one comes in His place. He is raised triumphantly from the dead. Filling out the hope of our future resurrection. Now notice what it says about Seth. Very end of the chapter. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. The serpent seed, characterized by unbelief, rebellion, violence. The righteous seed through Seth, characterized by faith. Such faith that they call upon the name of the Lord in prayer, in worship, in adoration, in praise. We are contemplating the righteous seed. Here's how I'd like to end. It's hard to see at first glance, but Jesus is all over chapter 4 if you have eyes to see. Do you remember Abel's blood? Do you remember what it cried out for? Justice! Vengeance! Friend, I want you to know that Abel was a type. He was a foreshadowing figure of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Listen to the author of Hebrews and what he says about the blood of Jesus Christ and compare it in contrast to Abel's blood. Hebrews 12, 24, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling, Jesus' blood that He shed for us. Notice what the author of Hebrews says, that speaks better things than the blood of Abel. What does blood of Abel cry out for? Justice! Vengeance! And friend, you ought to be on shouting ground that God's not giving you justice and vengeance. Instead, the blood of Jesus says something far more superior than the blood of Abel. The blood of Abel cries out, vengeance, justice. The blood of Jesus from the cross cries out, forgive them. Isn't isn't the mercy of God amazing? Do you remember Cain's curse? 
Let me, let me read it to you again to refresh your mind. It's threefold. He says this, from your face I'll be hidden. I'll be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Whoever finds me will kill me. Now, I want you to understand the beautiful, merciful irony that the Lord Jesus Himself takes upon Him the curse of Cain. Consider the curse of Cain, your face... I'm going to be hidden from your face. I want you to think in your mind, Matthew 27, as Jesus hung on the cross and the sky turned black and He cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken? Why have you hidden your face from me? If you have eyes to see when Christ is on the cross, He is bearing the curse of Cain. I'll be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. And Matthew 8.20 records from us, Foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay His head. Whoever finds me will kill me, Cain said. And in Matthew 26, as the soldiers were led by Jesus to find out the location of Christ as He prayed in the garden, Jesus gives Himself over to those who are seeking Him so that they can take Him and they can kill Him. Friend, that is amazing mercy. Do you remember what Lamech said? If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then my revenge and violence will be seventy times seven. And do you know that Jesus turns it on his head? In Matthew chapter 18, the disciples ask Jesus, How often shall we forgive? And do you remember how Jesus replied? Matthew 18, verse 22. I say not unto you until seven times. Jesus now quotes Lamech. He's quoting Genesis 4. He says, I say to you, you ought to forgive 70 times 7. Wow! Imagine this. The city and civilization built apart from God by Cain. The city and civilization built by God apart from Cain, characterized by unbelief characterized by violence, lived on a mantra of vengeance, vengeance to the nth degree. The city and civilization built by Christ operates on a whole different landscape. It's built not upon violence, not upon vengeance, not upon a selfish sense of justice. It's built upon God's justice and Christ's forgiveness. As Christ says, how often shall you forgive? Seventy times seven. You should forgive and forgive and forgive and my kingdom and my people and my city will be known by its forgiveness to which every single one of you and me sinners ought to say amen amen God we will see starting in chapter 5 God will work to build His own city. The building of a city is a theme that comes up again in chapter 10 and 11, the Tower of Babel. God is at work to build His own city. Jerusalem is just a foretaste of the new Jerusalem that God is ultimately building, the new heaven and the new earth. God is at work in the pages of Scripture to build a new city characterized by forgiveness. And He builds it through the ultimate act of mercy. God Himself becomes man. God Himself dies to atone for man's sin. God takes upon Himself the curse of Cain so He might reverse the words of Lamech. We have an amazingly merciful God. Are you reflecting that mercy? Are you clinging to that mercy? There are some here today, I'm sure, 
you are far from God. Because in your heart, you have this characterization of Him that is so false. He is for you. But if you harden yourself, one day He will be against you. Oh, but, but can you not see His mercy? Would you not repent today? Let's pray. Father, where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. And we say, thank you. If we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us. And we say, thank you. You have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. So you cry out to us, turn. Turn to me and live. And we say, thank you. Thank you for preserving the righteous seed and the wicked seed. Thank you for pouring out your rain on the just and the unjust. Thank you for modeling before us a patient, enduring love. Lord, I pray very specifically that there are some people today, time after time you've knocked on their heart's door, Time after time you've bid them repent. When you could have wiped them out, when you could have come to them with accusation, when you could have just annihilated them in your holy fury, you've come patiently, you've come through your spirit, you've questioned them, you've tried to get them to think, you've beckoned them, you've warned them, sin is at the door, it's crouching, it's one day going to destroy you. And you long, you do all of that because you long to save them. Lord, I'm praying that you would overwhelm these with a fresh vision of your mercy. There are others who haven't been performing well as Christians. They struggle with so much self-condemnation. They feel very distant from you this morning. I pray today that they have seen you to be a God whose arms are wide open, who's calling them back, who says to them personally, just turn to me, turn to me and live. My wrath I've poured out on my son, turn to me and live. There's no more condemnation. Turn to me and live. Christ is your righteousness. Turn to me and live. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Turn to me. Live. All who are thirsty, come and drink. And out of your spirit will flow rivers of living water. Turn to me and live. Oh God, would we, would we see clearly who you are? Forgive us for our unbelief. Thank you for the righteous seed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.